on an all-new Dr. Phil. Just how bad is homelessness in America? It's an epidemic. There's camps everywhere. Why is it getting worse? Our safety net has been devastated. We need to address mental health. Children are not able to walk to school without stepping on drug paraphernalia. If I was having a hard time, I would hope... wouldn't be put out in the freaking street. ...to talk about hard things. Stand by. We'll count you down. Today is going to be a changing day in your life. Five, four... Get ready to take care of you. I want you to imagine spending every day not knowing where you're going to sleep that night or how you will afford to buy food. Well, sadly, that's a daily life for hundreds of thousands of children, mothers, fathers, and single adults experiencing homelessness in this country. And let me tell you, this is not just a big city problem. It's happening coast to coast, town to town, spreading into the suburbs and communities near you. Headlines, news reports, and images of tents, scattered belongings, and people living on the sidewalks. And it's causing a huge divide in our country. Some want to help, and some want them just gone. Now, one thing is for sure. There is no easy solution to this problem, and homelessness in America has become a hotly contested social issue. Take a look. We're taking a close look at how the city of Portland is failing to help neighbors and the homeless. If you've been in downtown Denver recently, you can't help but notice one of the many homeless camps lining the sidewalks. The homeless issue in the east side is growing and residents say they are fed up. At first it was a few homeless people here and there. Now there's camps everywhere. CHP officers in hazmat suits cleared away a homeless encampment. The cleanup comes just weeks before the Super Bowl. We don't have too many options. It's either on the streets, on the sidewalks, or in front of somebody's business. And it's real embarrassing, and we don't want to be out here like that. We want our city to look good. We do need help. They are sweeping everywhere around this area and offering them no options of where to go. Here in San Diego, an estimated 8,000 people are experiencing homelessness. I don't think anyone wants to live out in the street. Uh, we saw rats all around here, needles all around, feces right here. No one wants to live in these conditions. No one does. Nobody deserves to live in the conditions that are now left here. What you can't see on this report is the smell, and it's bad. They tell you to get a job, but try to get a job without, you know, having a place to shower. We declared a housing emergency over six years ago, and people's eyes don't lie. They know that the problem is getting worse. We're completely tolerant of people, but it reached kind of a threshold or a line when we started observing a lot of drug deals and physical violence. Now Mayor Hancock wants to turn more hotels and motels into housing for people in need. House keys have more power to change a life than a tent. This is something that we're seeing more and more of in central Denver. Property owners setting up barricades to try to keep homeless campers away. The only recourse that we have is homeowners. It's not humane for the homeless, but it's not fair for the, the residents. Later in the show, Robin and I visited a homeless community and sat down with a young couple forced to call their RV home. 270 square feet with seven people. That's later. But first, joining me are three people at the forefront of fighting for the rights of homeless people. Please welcome Sarah Rankin, a professor at Seattle University School of Law, Paul Bowden, the organizing director for the Western Regional Advocacy Project in San Francisco, and Donald Whitehead, the executive director for National Coalition for the Homeless in Washington, D.C. So thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you. Let me say right off the top, I, I certainly don't have any answers, and I'm here to learn. So I'm hoping you are going to shed 
some serious light. I've been reading a lot of all of y'all's positions on things, and I, I hope to really enlighten many of our viewers. This millions of people are watching, and they want to know mm -hmm. what they can do to help. If there's something they can do, what's working, what's not working, and so I want to ask you some questions about all this, and I assume you're happy to answer them. Yes. Absolutely. Um, so people at home understand the gravity of this situation, just how bad is homelessness in America, and has it gotten worse? So it's, it's difficult to say how much the pandemic has upended things. Um, the way that we estimate the number of homeless people is pretty haphazard. A lot of people can't go out and, and count what's happening with the overall homeless population, but the expectation would be that would be growing. Um, it's an epidemic. We have well over uh, 1.2 million homeless children uh, and the estimates of homeless adults. Um, it's difficult to accept the numbers that just came out uh, because, like I said, a huge section of, of the overall homeless population hasn't been able to be counted. But the last, what I would call more credible numbers, sure. um, were well over half a million. And that's just people who could be counted. Right. And the vast majority of people are inv invisible. Okay, so Paul, why is it getting worse? Um, I think partially it's because we talk about counting the homeless people. Or, you know, why are you homeless? As opposed to looking at the systemic causes and the systemic solutions to poverty and racism and homelessness in America. So, you know, before 1998, when we did the homeless, you know, trying to get a sense of how bad is this issue, we used to do what was called a gaps analysis. And you have these massive waiting lists for affordable housing. You have waiting lists for treatment. You have waiting lists for uh, uh, shelter beds. And if you look at that gap between demand and supply, you can start setting up systemic responses. Well, we didn't address what created it. Nothing ends homelessness like a home. Okay, well, Donald, let me ask you, Sure. Why are people homeless? Well, Paul had it just right. It is the systemic issues. The two biggest underlying causes, though, are the lack of affordable housing and poverty. Uh, nowhere in the United States can you afford a two-bedroom housing unit if you earn minimum wage in this country. The federal government says you should only spend 30% of your income on housing. If you do that, the housing wage in the United States is $20 an hour on average. Um, we have in this country 11 million people that live rent burdened. That means that they're paying more than 30 percent, which is what the federal government says you should pay for housing for their housing. Some it's up to 70 percent. Is there any responsibility that you place on the people themselves rather than what the government's not doing? What about the people themselves? If you think about the issues that are uh, personal issues, there may be substance abuse or uh, there may be um, mental health issues. Um, those are diseases and uh, people are not responsible for diseases. Uh, so those may be uh, things that have an impact on homelessness, but they don't cause homelessness. We know that we have people with substance abuse issues and mental health issues at every stage of America. Some are politicians, some run businesses, but they're not homeless because they have a safety net. Our safety net has been devastated in this country. And so people um, who are at the, the bottom of the economic ladder have very little choice uh, if they run into those issues. And most of it is trauma related. Um, it's either financial trauma or uh, trauma from childhood. All of these things are part of why people become homeless and why they, they rely on things like substances. No one wants to be homeless in this country. Well, of course not. I know the Brookings Institute did a, a study and they concluded that there were three things that contributed to uh, being in a, a really bad spot. They said, number one, if you graduate from high school, number two, if you marry after you're 21 and have children after you're married, and three, if you have a full-time job, that you have less than 2% likelihood of being in poverty and a 74% chance of being in the middle class. What most people think homelessness is, is the homelessness you see. That is the tip of the iceberg. Monday.
She's 73 and raising another grandchild. This was not your life plan. Absolutely not. You can write enabler on me. I know what I am. Yeah, I've got a Sharpie. Don't tempt me. Your mom says you come home, get in comfortable clothes, get on the couch, and watch TV while your daughter's by herself. Will mom step up? You have a lot of excuses for not getting to the next level. I don't know how. That's Monday. Then on Tuesday. Award-winning actress Regina King's 26-year-old son took his life. I would trade me just one more time. Ranking the stressors in life, this is number one. That's Tuesday. Right now, there are a lot of jobs available. What do you what do you say about that? One of the biggest misconceptions that people have is that what we're talking about here is all of homelessness. What most people think homelessness is is the homelessness you see, right? People um, who are living exposed on the street. The folks who are living exposed on the street are primarily chronically homeless individuals, and that has a federal definition. One of the hallmarks, the required hallmarks of somebody being chronically homeless is that they have a documentable disabling condition that prevents them from working or maintaining housing. So we're talking about chronic illness, um, substance use disorder, severe untreated mental illness. It's really important for us to understand that because that segment of the overall homeless population is not all homeless people. In fact, nationally, it's 20% it's or less. Um, so that most visible segment that you see is the tip of the iceberg in terms of the people who are well, this homeless. This is where I get confused because uh, you, you see so many different statistics. One statistic yeah. says there are half a million uh, homeless people. Uh, then the Department of Education says 1.2 because they include couch surfing. Mm -hmm. and things like that. People who are, are in terms of visible homelessness are generally predominantly suffering from chronic homelessness, which requires the presence of a disabling condition that prevents you from working or maintaining housing. Okay. So those numbers will be higher when you're talking about chronically homeless people. Um, they will be lower when you're talking about homelessness overall. The federal government and these institutes and stuff, they, they love to study our poverty. They love to try to figure out who we are, not not to address the systemic causes, but like when you want to kill an issue, you study it. Like, like let's just start well, addressing it. That's not fair. But hear me that, out. That's hear not me fair. Out. Shouldn't you study this? 39 years after the advent of contemporary homelessness, we're debating whether how many, what percentage are this, what percentage are that. You know, the Department of Education uses the old standard of counting who's homeless, which included couch surfing, which included being doubled up. When they wanted to launch an initiative called the Chronic Homeless Program, they changed the definition of who counts as being homeless. So that they could focus the resources on single adults in urban quarters, the Dr. visible Jill, homeless. Let, let me just so, add this. Uh, there's one other piece about chronic homelessness that should be understood, just to be clear on it. Um, you qualify as a chronically homeless person if you've been continuously homeless for a year or more. Uh, or you've had four episodes in three years. Right. So that is a very small portion of the population. The overwhelming majority of the population is episodic. Their homelessness is for, is, is for a very short time, although they may experience it more than one time during a year. Uh, and Paul, let me ask you, why is it important to get the categorization? Does it have to do with funding whether somebody's chronically homeless or whether they qualify that way or not, does that have to do with what resources they qualify to get? Um, no, it does. Well, I, I mean, the danger of it is that we're institutionalizing homelessness in this country. Poverty existed before 1983. Mental illness, I'm pretty sure we had mental illness in this country before 1983. Certainly substance abuse and racism and underpaying jobs or, or you know, abuse of frontline workers. Those things all existed, you know? And so instead of addressing those issues, we continue to ignore them. We continue to, to sweep it under the rug. And that led to another, a second round of extreme poverty to the point of people living out in the streets. I was out there. We're not that different. Don't categorize us and dehumanize us to now we're the homeless 
as opposed to we're community members just like everybody else. We need to be educating ourselves by looking at the humanity of the people that we're talking about and really treating my brother and sister the way I want to be treated as well. If I was having a hard time, I would hope to God I live in a society where I wouldn't be put out in the freaking street and having to fend for myself. You know how dangerous it is out there? That's not how we should be forcing people to live because they're mentally ill or because they have this or because they didn't graduate high school. That's just not humane. And Paul makes a... Come in before we go to break. Well, I was just going to say, Paul made an incredible point that everybody should understand that these are people, their mothers, their fathers, their sisters and daughters. The reason we continue to have homelessness is because we have never created the resources to the scale of the problem. So if you don't accurately count the problem, you'll never provide the resources necessary to end it. Okay, but the question then becomes, what is the solution? If you are going to deal with this, if you're not going to turn your head away, look away because it's unpleasant, if you're not going to sweep it under the rug, you are going to try and do something that has a real impact, then what is that solution? When it comes to homelessness, some say advocacy groups are doing nothing but enabling a problem that is deeply rooted in mental illness and addiction, leaving residents fearful of walking the streets. We're going to meet the other side of the conversation after the break. A woman was brutally beaten by a homeless man at a metro bus stop. Down the block, a beating. More violence. Now two separate groups of tourists were attacked, and there have been multiple shootings. We're out here, you know, unhoused. We're not criminals, not all of us. I don't have family. My mother's dead, father's dead. I got sick. Wound up losing my work and everything. We just worry about staying alive. My life is a nightmare. I'm doing the right things to get somewhere, and I ain't going no damn way. I'm really trying my best to be something. Well, I need a little room or a kitchenette. My biggest hope is that the day will come that when I first wake up in my apartment, I'm not worried that I'm still on the street. When I wake up and I'm not at home. You're walking down the streets, nobody would recognize you as a homeless person. It will not take my pride or my confidence at all. Period. Well, advocates say headlines of violent crimes and stories of rampant drug use and mental illness have helped create a dangerous stereotype of homeless people. Now, many say that's just not true. Claiming addiction and mental illness are the most prolific causes of homelessness. And the media is just reporting the truth. How do I train my staff to deal with uh, mentally ill people? It's not because they're bad people. The services aren't there for them. We are just getting dumped on. Richard Madrid just opened DK Public Restaurant and shared video of someone lighting themselves on fire outside in front of customers. For the second time in two weeks, a woman was brutally beaten by a homeless man at a metro bus stop. The first attack was outside L.A. County USC Medical Center and left a nurse dead. Down the block, a beating. More violence. And Noah Geisel watched it unfold. I was sitting right underneath where the camera was and someone just walks up and just out of nowhere starts beating this man senselessly. Now two separate groups of tourists were attacked and there have been multiple shootings. It's collapsing and unsafe in a way that Portland is, has not seen, I don't think, at least in my 20 years here. Well, joining the conversation now are Mark Powell, a former San Diego County Board of Education Vice President, as well as Cleo Patriciak and Matt McCoveyak, who are co-founders of Save Austin Now, a nonpartisan citizen group dedicated to protecting the quality of life in Austin, Texas. So thank all of you for being here. Thank, thank you. you. Um, I, I said uh, before you came out, and I'll say again, uh, I'm here to learn and help all of my viewers learn as well. I sure as hell don't have the answers uh, to this, but I have a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. Mark, Cleo, and Matt, you, you all say homelessness is primarily driven by mental health and addiction. And if you were just giving someone housing, 
that that's just not the solution, whereas you do support a position of home first. We're not saying home only. There is, we're not talking about housing only. It's housing first. I know you show on this on this show sometimes Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We've all learned about it. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. There you and go. The very bottom of it is all of your basic human needs. You Food, have to get breathing. survival taken care of first. Yes, and you can't reach those higher levels of development without housing. So I, I don't want to create a false dichotomy um, that people on this side are only talking about housing. Um, and I, I don't want to have it be. I mean, we're set up here to be like a, opponents. Um, where well, what no, no, we this should is be the doing only is way we can get cameras and keep in COVID <laughs> that, compliance. That might, that, might be, that might be true, but it's at not the same might time, be. It is. Right. <laughs> it, it, you know, might yeah, be. It, you can see where the cameras be. are. It might be, but also, you know, the issue is so polarizing um, that that, and it's so easy to 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 prompt fear and anger in people. It's the easiest thing in the world to do, and people can't can't listen to each other. Right when we're talking in emotions and ideologies. Well, so. I hope that's not going to be the case today. But what we really need to do is we need to address mental health. And the best way to address mental health to prevent homelessness is address it in the public schools. Because students that are left untreated with untreated mental health conditions oftentimes grow up to be untreated adults with mental health Ill illness. And sometimes we'll use substances to self-medicate. So one of the ways to help prevent homelessness is to prevent it at the beginning and the best place to do that is at our public schools i i agree and we've researched it because the incarceration of mentally ill people in our prisons and jails is off the hook and it has been since the institutionalization because the community-based care the the community-based treatment programs for people with mental severe mental illness that are poor never got fully funded. So I agree with you. Well, Let's no, you don't, get no, I don't think treatment. you do agree with me. You know? Because you want to address it when they're already on the street. I'm saying... No, I don't. I'm saying... No, I don't. I'm saying you need to address it. Because I was homeless it. that I really no. want everybody you else need, to be homeless what before I'm they is, get access. What I'm saying is you need to address it in public schools. Same. You said the I'm problem for homelessness, <laughs> the problem for homelessness is to build homes. So when you categorize... Well, what we're saying is that hold program on a that we're talking about, Housing First, has a 90% success rate the problem with housing first they measure success by only one statistic heads in beds isn't that what we want heads in beds you're not measuring whether someone is working whether their children are in school whether they're saving money homelessness ends with a home Cleo. way in here cleo i am a daughter of mexican immigrants we always have been supportive of homeless communities, always. However, we are making homeless, right now, reluctant to receive services. We had Haven for Hope at the state state of Texas Same advocating way. for uh, the statewide camping <laughs> ban because they are saying that homeless are refusing shelter because they're making it too easy having open camping where they can receive drugs whenever they want. They're being brought food. They're making it too easy that they do not want to go to shelter. Um, but the other uh, problem with this is we're undermining um, uh, ho homeless agencies that are actually working, like Community First in Austin. Uh, I'm sorry, would it surprise you to know that Community First is a Housing First program? Let's money. define Housing First, because yeah. Housing First, according to the federal monies, is only that you have to provide a roof over their head and they do not have to comply with mental health and drug treatment. It's housing, it's permanent supportive housing. So what we're saying w when we have that program is that you provide the roof over their head and then you bring in the services. Right, but True. in Austin, Texas, when they account for the, 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 the people that have been sheltered and are receiving it, they are walking out and not com complying with the shelter. The, I'm the, sorry, the only, that's the not only... accurate information. So let me give you another thing that's inaccurate. You said that people don't go to shelters because they don't want to go to shelters or they want to stay outside. The reason they don't go to shelter is that in no city in the entire United States of America is there enough shelter for the entire homeless population in that city. I agree That's with that. That's why people aren't going to shelter. Right. People want shelter. People don't want to be exposed to right. the elements. We, well, we, we don't have enough shelter. So if people, instead of criminalizing mm -hmm. homeless people and attacking them and raising money to do that, they should be raising money to help build housing. I think the first question I think we should all ask ourselves is, are we reducing homelessness in America today or is it growing? 
And if the goal is to reduce homelessness, then we have to step back and evaluate why what is happening at the federal level and at the state level, particularly in California, is failing. Housing First started in 2013. The five years before Housing First, homelessness decreased by 16 percent. Since then, it has been rising at a time when permanent supportive housing has increased 47 percent. We have seen homelessness also increase 20 percent. The problem with Housing First, and you, you put a statistic out there that said 90 percent success rate. They measure success by only one statistic. Heads in beds, generally for six, a six-month period. Isn't that why we want heads in beds? It's not the only metric, sir. Mm -hmm. It's simply not the only metric. I, not, I hang understand on. that. Okay, Absolutely. so hang on. You're not, you're not measuring whether someone is working. You're not measuring whether their children are in school. You're not measuring whether they're saving money. You're not measuring whether they're reducing their debt. These are all Do things. Do we measure how, how that happens in someone that's housed? Okay. We're there's, holding there's, people there's, to there's a, a standard that's not real. There's a key distinction. What's the key distinction? Taxpayer dollars are being expended right for homeless individuals uh -huh. to help them. Yes, so, and, so and the housing we have to, subsidy program in America is the second largest tax write-off for homeowners. And we, we, subsidize, hang on, we subsidize home ownership to the tune of $127 billion a year, and we call it economic stimulus. But we do $37 billion on housing for poor people, and we want to dissect them, like we're doing here. Are, are, is it mental illness? Is it this? Why are we competing against the other? It's Homelessness in ends with a home. Okay, we have to take a break. Next, Matt, Cleo, and Mark claim cities are incentivizing a lifestyle of vagrancy by allowing street sleeping, panhandling, public urination, and more. But Sarah, Paul, and Donald say enforcing those laws is inhumane to people that are just trying to survive. We'll talk about that after the break. It is night number one for a new and controversial homeless campsite in the city of Sacramento. This is this crisis response. It's essentially, you know, this is this is homeless ER. It looks like a damn concentration camp. The Texas bill, another step closer to becoming law, this would punish the homeless for simply sleeping outside. Monday, a new Dr. Phil. She's 73 and raising another grandchild. This was not your life plan. You can write enabler on me. I know what I am. Yeah, I've got a Sharpie. Don't tempt me. That's Monday. Dozens of people living at a homeless encampment in Oceanside are being forced to leave. They're pushing us out of here by force. People involved in each other's lives in ways that was giving them an inner worth to get, to want to live, to want to get off drugs or do something that's constructive. The government has kind of let everybody down because they don't have no affordable housing for anybody. We had three fentanyl overdoses in one day. Who knows if that's going to cause them to end up in someone's backyard? You understand? There's desperation that goes on here. In communities all over the country, some residents are pushing for stricter laws to sweep their streets of homeless people. Now, that's criminalizing, essentially, the fact that people don't have anywhere to go. This is a very polarizing issue, and I want to talk about that in, in just a minute. But, Donald, I have a couple questions for you, because you were making the point that it's not uh, home only, mm -hmm. uh, that it's getting someone in a home, getting them off the street. Mm -hmm. If someone is mentally ill or an alcoholic or an addict, you're certainly moving in the right direction if you can get them out of the elements, get a roof over their head, get them where they're not subject to being assaulted while they're asleep, yes. having everything, what little they own, stolen when they go to sleep. But when they do get a, a home through this program, they they do pay for it. They pay 30% of whatever disability they may have. They also have a caseworker that comes uh, four times a month that visits to monitor the situation in theory, and I know they're spread thin and do the best they can, but they are monitored. Absolutely. And they're expected to participate in treatment if it's for alcoholism or drugs or whatever. That's part of the agreement when they get the home, right? And they're encouraged to do that. Yeah. So, okay. Right. But if they, if they don't, what are the consequences? If, if they don't 
um, go right into treatment, um, there, there is no penalty for them not doing that. They gradually move into it, and most people do. And they have to abide by the tenancy rules. So they can't uh, do anything in that unit which would be illegal for any other human being. Nationwide, we've seen those sorts of projects have anywhere from the high 70th percentile retention rates to the high 90th percentile retention rates. I'm not a big fan of housing first. I said nothing ends homelessness like a home. I, I object to the fact that housing first prioritizes this segment of the unhoused community over this segment of the unhoused community. And I always feel that you go to the line item at HUD on the HUD budget, you go to the blue book for the HUD budget, there's no line item that says housing first, here's $16 billion. That doesn't exist. Housing first is a tagline. It's a media public relations so, campaign that, that is implemented one way here, another way here, a slight with the same priority categories of who can access it. We don't have quantifiable outcomes for Housing First in Austin, Texas, where Matt and I met. Um, the problem is we have uh, homeless shelters that when the camping ban was lifted, 20% uh, of them in 2019 walked out of the shelter and went to open camping on our streets. And why I got involved is because the poorest communities, underserved communities, were being overwhelmed. I'm advocating for children in Austin right now that do not have safe access to parks, are not able to walk to school without stepping on drug paraphernalia or seeing illicit behavior, open drug markets. That is unacceptable for that to be happening. And we cannot claim that homeless advocates have the moral authority saying that, nope, we're going to let them have open camping because we don't have enough shelters. We have homeless that are leaving shelters because they do not want to comply with rules. They do not want to comply with treatment. And if there is not that legislative component to get them to say, you have to respond to shelter, you have to respond to drug treatment, they will go to the streets because it's easy for them. Well, that begs the question. I mean, do... <laughs> Living in the do, street do, is do, not that's, easy. That's, okay, I'm sorry. It's a, it's a it's figure not speech. easy it's for us. That's, 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 that's not people, why I meant that. Do people that own property... Do taxpayers that have parks in their neighborhoods, do they have the right to the peaceable use and existence of that property? We sat down and actually talked to each other as human beings rather than people on a talk show. We're supposed to duke this out. Did you not want to we be would... here? If you or someone you know, send me an email or text Phil to 88500. That's Phil to 88500. With less money. We're in season 20 and we could not do it without you. If you're going to be in the Los Angeles area and would like to watch a live taping here in the studio, go to drphil.com and click on Be Part of the Audience and select In Studio. We'll see you soon. Do people that own property, do taxpayers that have parks in their neighborhoods, do they have the right? to the peaceable use and existence of that property and those parks without worrying that their kids are going to step on a needle and pick up, contract a disease or or whatever. I mean, do the, we... The answer is yes. And, and, and this is, again, there's this false, you know, we're, po we're sitting aside from each other. If we sat down and actually talked to each other as human beings rather than people on a talk show who are supposed to duke this out... Did you not want to be would, here? No, <laughs> I do want to be here because I think there's a way... There, there, it, what's so, that, what's so important... You don't what's have so, to school us. We are actually I'm talking. I'm not trying to school you. I'm trying to reach out to you. I'm right. saying... But we are on the same side. We are on the same side. We are just explaining... Well, Explaining well, in well, distress well, what we are seeing and, in Austin and, and what I'm brought here. a Democrat and a Republican yeah. together so, so to I work think together. I think the issue is solutions, right? <laughs> so so it, it seems like there there is one kind of central thing that connects all of us. We don't want to see people on the streets of this country. Nobody I, does. I think nobody here wants that. But what we're arguing is that moving people from <laughs> camp to camp is not effective. And you know who else believes in that argument? The CDC. We're still in a pandemic, and the worst thing you can do with people living outdoors is to move them around. It's really an inhumane way of treating people. These are people, well, and it's a really inhumane way of doing it. So we have three simultaneous crises going on in America. We have a mental health crisis. Agree. 
we have a substance abuse crisis, Agreed. and we have a housing affordability crisis. Yes. Okay, we all agree. Yes. Do you remember the movie The Perfect Storm? Three converging storms come together, and they crush that boat, and it was absolutely no way for that boat to escape. That's what we have. But when you guys lump all of these into one category and call them homeless, the general idea is that building homes is going to solve the issue. And that's mm -hmm. not going to solve the issue. What hold on a second. Hold on, hold on a second. Guys. Hold on a second. So when, when you have these, these situations where you have these encampments, that creates a danger, Dr. Phil, to everybody in the community. There's, there's, there was a hepatitis outbreak in San Diego. Well, I can't even walk with my kids on the beach barefoot because the homeless sleep on the beach, they shoot up their drugs, they throw them in the sand, and I don't want to get stuck and get HIV or hepatitis. So, yes, it's not against the law to be homeless, and I understand we're compassionate, but it's against the law to do drugs and throw your needles on the ground. It's against a lot of eminent domain, public property. I can't just go in the canyon behind my house and go, I'm confiscating an extra three I, I acres. Was just, this I was is just mine. hanging and out that's, with That's what they're first. doing. Listen, that's exactly what they're doing. San Diego's gentrifying like crazy. LA's gentrifying like crazy. San Francisco's gentrifying like crazy. And then they sit there and say, I can't even go out. I can't go in. But damn, the, the condo developers haven't heard that message clearly. The perfect storm also includes racism and classism and commodification of health care and education. Let's have gentrified communities where we're fixing up our neighborhoods <laughs> without displacing the poor people from those neighborhoods and making them freaking homeless. Next. Robin and I visited a homeless community where I sat down with a young couple who went from living in a condo in the suburbs to struggling to survive in an RV. My conversation with them after the break. What happened that you were unable to retain four walls and a roof over your head? I got sick. I lost overtime. I lost hours. And it's just been a snowball downhill. It's a horrible feeling knowing if your kid's going to make a dinner tonight, you know? Kids pick on them when they find out they live in a trailer. What's coming up on Dr. Phil? Visit our website and subscribe to our newsletter. You'll get weekly updates, live strategies, and exclusive video that you won't find anywhere else. Plus, on DrPhil.com, you can see sneak previews of upcoming shows. Log on today. Well, earlier I mentioned I sat down and spoke with a young couple living in a homeless RV community. But what you don't know is that hundreds of families in this community, many with children, were at one point facing eviction. We're a RV park that caters to less fortunate people. And y'all came under attack at one point not long ago, right? They were trying to get people out of here, is that right? That's correct. The city felt like we were overextending the amount of people that are here. How many were they going to run out? Approximately 57 RVs, 281 people. Really? Yeah. 57 RVs, 281 people? Correct. Okay, so what happened? We met with the city. They did a complete check on our facility for our sewer, water, and electric. We're going to make sure that you are not homeless and out on the street. When your team and yourself came in, your presence alone made it so this place is actually open. It was incredible. Well, I'm glad it had an impact because I'd hate to have 281 people out on the street. Where would they go if they left here? Be, would they just be on the street? They would just be on the street. These are RVs that aren't really accepted at other RV parks. There's okay. a 10-year rule. If the RV is more than 10 years old, most parks won't allow them to come in their park. They can rely on their neighbors. We have people to leave their kids with other people, their dogs, everything. What's the crime in here? There is no crime. Everybody seems to be completely happy. It's a community. So no crime. If there is crime, we automatically get rid of them immediately. How many kids are in this property here? In this park, between 80 and 100. And where do they go to school? You know, we were able to implement a system that the buses come here between 7 and 8.30. So this is working. Very low crime. Kids are going to school. Some of the people are working and the elderly are in a community where people are kind of looking after them. Exactly, exactly. And it seems to be a, a, a really good fit the way it's been going. Well, you know what? We've been talking about this and I think we've just kind of scratched the surface. So we're out of time today. 
But at the RV park, I met with a family that was living paycheck to paycheck until finally that paycheck, well, it just wasn't enough. And they ended up losing their place and living in a trailer on the side of the street. Nobody would take them. Tomorrow, my raw and very real conversation with this mother and father just trying to feed their family and survive day to day. Tomorrow on an all-new Dr. Phil. The homeless battle is once again heating up. Communities say, we don't want those people in our backyard. What do you say to a family whose daughter was stabbed to death by a homeless person? You put up a fence around your property to feel safe. I'm a prisoner in my own house. I'm barely making it. I'm living dime to dime. So who all's living in this RV that you have? Seven people. That's tomorrow. Uh, we're going to continue our dialogue. Uh, to learn more about the issue of homelessness, go to drphil.com, where I will have a list of resources that you can use. And don't forget to follow and um, subscribe to my podcast, Fill in the Blanks. You're going to find a lot of information there on things that I really think are important for us to be considering right now at this time. Uh Thank you.